for having all of us here, including myself. Uh, we, these events are very important. Sydney and I have talked about it in terms of uh, really rising the tide for crowdfunding and alternative finance and all the possibilities throughout so many different vertical markets, so many different geographical markets that Sydney's going to, that our company's going to. So it's, it's important for the industry as a whole. And our panel is on women entrepreneurs. And I can honestly say that all of us are women entrepreneurs. And after we, what we heard from Richard a few moments ago, uh, crowdfunding, uh, he's mentioned it to me before, it actually has the crowdfunding as well as um, some of the other alternative finance mechanisms has the ability to level the playing field finally for minorities and women because of how banks traditionally lend. And we're seeing a lot of really positive results from uh, women businesses and with women crowdfunding campaigns. On our panel, we have, uh, I'm gonna let everyone introduce themselves, but we have some rock stars here. Obviously, everyone knows Candace Klein. She needs no introduction, but she's gonna speak to us about debt. And we also have Trisha, who uh, runs a portal and is going to talk to us from the investment side of the equation. Uh, Rebecca and is from the media side, an entrepreneur in the media business, as well as myself. I'm from the on, uh, I'm from the media business, and we also um, have Adapia, who is a serial entrepreneur and has had huge successes in a lot of a variety of different areas and is now with Patch of Land on the real estate portal side. Um, so I'm going to start. I'll introduce myself and then we'll have each of you introduce. Um, so again, my name is Andrea Downs. I am the founder and CEO of Coastal Shows. We, did, uh, we also do the Crowdfund Global Expo as well as a series of crowdfund summits throughout the U.S. and throughout um, worldwide actually. Uh, previous to that, I had started and built a, in, the largest independent media company in the wireless fi and finance and investment on the wireless side um, for over 12 years and then sold it to UBM, which in our world is, is sort of the big media company that owns like PR Newswire. So I did that, then took some time off and am back now having started Coastal Shows and real happy to work with a lot of the people here today in Sydney and of course our panelists. So we'll start with you, Rebecca. Uh, sure, um, I am a media entrepreneur. I'm the founder and content creator behind Silicon Dragon. Uh, we publish a newsletter which reports on venture capital and innovations and tech entrepreneurs in primarily in emerging markets uh, with China and India as a focal point. I uh, am a journalist by training. I worked in New York Magazine world for many years and then got the call from Red Herring Magazine during the dot-com boom uh, and came out here to Silicon Valley um, and covered venture capital internationally for Red Herring. Uh, I then followed the money, the venture capital trail into China and into India uh, and wrote two books. Uh, the first one is Silicon Dragon, the second one is Startup Asia. And then I caught the entrepreneurial bug myself and started Silicon Dragon Ventures, which does news and events in, in emerging markets. Our next one is in Hong Kong, uh, April 15, and then Beijing is May 15, and we'll be back in, in Silicon Valley later this year, October 2nd. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, I'm Ada Pia, and as you know, I'm a Chief Marketing Officer of Patch of Land. Um, I actually started wanting to be a fund manager when I was little, and uh, <laughs> started off working in a bank, actually ended up in uh, insurance and hedge funds in Europe for a while, and um, I was there during the financial crash of 2008 and uh, left around 2009 uh, to actually pursue my own ventures. I began managing my sister who is an artist, and I turned her into a global brand and uh, did that a lot through digital media, social media, when I was starting out. Um, have done Kickstarter campaign, Indiegogo campaigns. I've been aware of crowdfunding from the beginning from as a user. Um, and my consulting in brand marketing took me into Mattel and Disney in the entertainment space, worked, in, um, worked with a 
a movie director, we launched our own digital distribution business. So I've kind of had this like wide gamut of things that brought me back into finance because it's my love and my passion, but with it comes a lot of consulting for startups and tech and all these things that, that really bring it together. So I find that um, being able to have that kind of like cross crossing over everything has been really, uh, really great for me. Um, so I bring a little bit of everything uh, to the table in terms of crowdfunding. My name is Trish Costello. I'm the founder and CEO of Portfolia. Portfolia engages uh, influential consumers and lets them invest and back uh, entrepreneurial companies they believe in. We are subtly focused on women because women basically buy 80% of all products and our uh, platform lets them not only invest, but bring their social networks and their combined buying power to the companies and teams and products they want to see succeed in the marketplace. Uh, prior to Portfolio, uh, I created the Kauffman Fellows Program. I was on the uh, Kauffman Foundation startup team 20 years ago, actually, is when we started Kauffman Foundation. Uh, and Kauffman Fellows are 400 venture capitalists in 50 countries collectively deploying about, about $200 billion. So it was the original training program, leadership and networking program for young venture capitalists. And um, it's with those relationships that I'm able to identify excellent companies, um, often the Kauffman Fellows or angel networks that, uh, that we started through Kauffman um, are the ones that source deals to us, uh, often they've done, they've done the diligence, um, and then we come in as a part of those. Um, I really believe that when women are, when their financial power is unlocked, when they're able to green light the companies and the teams and the products that they want to see succeed in the marketplace, that we are going to see a tremendous shift in the world. Um, Women buy the majority of all products, but only one half of 1% of accredited women invest. Uh, I think they're ready to step up. There's you know, more details we can share with you about that. Um, and we all know about the Silicon Valley Boys Club. And uh, you know, I, think we're, I think we're at probably the most amazing shift and change for women that we'll see in my lifetime right today. So I'm really excited to be a part of this panel to talk about it. Preach a sister. Come on, cheese a round of applause. That was testifying. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Candace Klein, and I am so excited to be on this panel with these esteemed ladies. In fact, I'm just here to take copious notes. Um, I uh, am an attorney um, who fell into crowdfunding by defending Prosper. Um, when they were in trouble with uh, the SEC in the 50 states. Um, and that's how I cut my teeth on the law right out of law school and started my first business in 2010 called Bad Girl Ventures. Uh, yes, I am a bad girl. Um, <laughs> and uh, BGV is a microfinance company that invests in female founders um, and has invested in several hundred female owned businesses at this point with debt. Um, my passion is absolutely debt and I'll explain that in a little while. I started a debt-based crowdfunding platform, um, and this, this was the first debt-based crowdfunding platform in the country um, in 2011, and was very active in um, the drafting and the regulations thereafter from the Jobs Act, chaired the CIFRA group uh, that was mentioned by Sydney earlier for the first year after the signing of the Jobs Act and worked with the SEC and the promulgation of the regulations that we're talking through today. And um, my company was then shut down by my state regulators. So that's a conversation for another day. Um, but uh, you, know, you run into regulatory issues uh, when you're in the crowdfunding space. So I can talk about that firsthand. Um, sold that, uh, is in the process of selling potentially the assets of that um, and um, have recently done some consulting work. And the organizations that I'm most actively involved in and why I'm here on this panel today include two. Uh, the first is an NGO called Women Investing in Women. Uh, this is an organization that operates worldwide in not only teaching female entrepreneurs how to better package themselves to be eligible and ready for investment, but also 
with a portfolio as a partner, training high net worth women how to be more active investors, um, not to be the LP, but rather the GP in the investment decision. Um, and that will actually increase the flow of capital into female entrepreneurs. The second organization that I'm consulting with and that I'm here representing today is DealStruck. DealStruck is a debt-based uh, peer-to-peer lending platform, peer-to-business lending platform, based in California, um, and launched about a year ago. Uh, they've been doing great work. They've, they actually are the first uh, crowdfunding or debt-based peer-to-peer platform to go down market and offer more than just term loan products. They also offer a line of credit, and they will go further down retail over time. And they're the first in the country to do that, to open up the opportunity to peers and to the crowd to invest in uh, multiple debt products. And so I'm here to talk about all of those things. So as you can see, we have a great panel. Um, I'm going, I have a few questions on debt, a few questions on investment, and a few questions overall on uh, women entrepreneurs. So I'm going to start with, um, from the borrower perspective, Candace and possibly Trisha or whoever wants to comment. According to Indiegogo's site, 42% of the successful campaigns are run by women. Uh, women raise more than men when it comes to the number of contributions and the amount. Overall, though, the average woman-owned business has 25% lower revenue than the typical male-owned firm in the same industry. And this is a statistic from the Department of Commerce. Would, would either of you like to comment on why there's this discrepancy between women being very successful at crowdfunding, yet at the same time the revenue numbers being lower? I'm happy to go first. Sure. Okay, so um, women-owned women, uh, women -owned businesses now represent 51% of all privately held companies in the United States, which sounds very exciting. However, if you look at businesses that are, have five employees or more, that number drops to 7.8% mm -hmm. um, of companies that have five employees or more. And so women are typically um, much more risk-averse and run much smaller businesses. That will translate over to their crowdfunding campaigns. And so um, Richard mentioned that women have lower risk tolerance, um, that their campaigns are typically lower in dollar amount, but that they're more successful with those campaigns. Um, and I think that that's absolutely a, an indication of what we've seen across the board. Um, so I don't know that women are, I, I think women will be more successful in their crowdfunding campaigns, but they will certainly be more conservative in the amount of capital that they seek to raise. So I think that we're still dealing when we're looking at these kinds of numbers, and I'm 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 going to you know hit that hit the, hit the question more from the standpoint because I think there's a a suggestion in it of can women or do women want to really grow companies that are highly successful that are scaling that are fast growth, and really what I come back to is that oftentimes we start we start companies based on the kind of resources that we can access, and truly women do not have the ability to access, do not have the, the entree to access the kind of big dollars and traditionally haven't had that access to be able to create fast growth scalable businesses. If we can't get that money, then we have to create businesses where we can can grow them just on our on our you know on the revenue that we can take and we can bootstrap them. Um, and, and so you know I really believe that's why crowdfunding is going to change this. 4.2% of the leaders uh, in the venture capital world, the GPs are women. And it is less than 10% of the money uh, of venture capital that's going into women businesses right now. So um, that's, what we, that's what I think that crowdfunding helps us overcome. And when we're able to actually access the kind of resources that will enable us to grow rapidly, I think we're going to see these numbers really uh, even out. I, I, I believe it really has a lot to do with with an inability to, uh, to access uh, capital. Adapia, do you see with Patch of Land um, statistics that are similar with the women-owned companies that are um, on your platform or any trends that sound familiar? Um, none of the developers or real estate operators on our platform are women. Oh. So, not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. I want that to change, too. Okay. Well, I've covered, as a journalist, I've covered alternative financing for a number of years, and I just see the preponderance of these club deals, um, and I just don't see them going away. Um, I think uh, 
the VC partners, it's mostly a male club. They mostly do deals with one another, one another because they know one another well, because they play golf with one another. Their families socialize. Uh, women uh, don't seem to be as good about creating this kind of social network environment. But women but. are lower risk. And I think that this is an interesting, if, if we're looking at just the numbers, um, just the investment opportunity, I think it's interesting to note, um, and this is a study that's been done by American Express uh, based on SBA numbers, that particularly in the debt space, and that's what I understand and know, uh, women actually repay loans at a much higher rate than their male counterparts. Default rates are nearly 10% lower for female-owned businesses than for male-owned businesses. Um, and so they, they take less money, um, but they repay it at, at higher rates. And I think that's an important statistic to understand. Extremely important. I would definitely agree. And, and, and that's really the same on the equity side, too. They actually get 25% less money when they do get money, but they grow at a 10% faster rate. So, so they, you know, the, the old, uh, old, old saw that we think of about being um, very creative about how to use money definitely holds true both on the equity and the debt side. And to your point about, you know, uh, the social club of, women, you know, women versus men, we are actually, I'm working with Women Investing in Women um, that Candace mentioned, along with three other women's groups, and having specific women networking mixers and sessions at all of our events this year to try to bring that up and, and help the platforms attract those, the women buyers specifically. Um, when it comes to the crowdfunding industry, only 12% of angels are females. A stat for, this is a stat from the Center for Venture of Research. Thankfully, though, more and more opportunities and ventures are popping up every day, um, making it easier for women to invest, get fundraising, and rise up in the business world. And of course, we've heard that from Richard. We're seeing that based on the uh, statistics that you guys have mentioned, and we're pushing for that. Um, you know, obviously, there's a lot of very successful women entrepreneurs here. Uh, we have Joy Schaffler, Jillian Adapia, who's been a, a serial entrepreneur, a, a lot of women who are really rising up. Um, would you guys like to comment on the investment side of that equation? I think crowdfunding could be a really good door opener for female entrepreneurs and female financiers. Um, and that hasn't, uh, we haven't had this door opened uh, through the venture capital or angel investing world. So crowdfunding could be, could emerge as a great door opener. Also, and again, in the debt space, I think it's, it's interesting to see how women participate in debt investment opportunities versus equity. And what I have noticed in the platforms that I've consulted with and the platforms that I've owned is that the, the participation rate of female investors and female entrepreneurs is much, much higher for debt platforms than it is for equity because we understand debt. We pay mortgages, we pay credit cards, we understand debt. Equity is a much more difficult concept to, to learn uh, and takes time to understand and it takes an environment of, of like-minded people to be able to do due diligence on a deal. Debt underwriting is decades old and we're much more familiarized with that. So what we've noticed across the board, and this is not just with DealStruck or with my previous company, this is also with Lending Club and with Prosper, you see much higher female participation on those platforms as investors. So on the investment side, too, and I, I just want to update uh, one of the numbers that Andrea just mentioned here. Uh, the Center for Venture Research at University of North, uh, or New Hampshire, which is really kind of the leading space, traditionally it's been 11 to 12 percent, but uh, in the last 18 months, those numbers have actually jumped to 22 percent. Oh, that is very good news. So I really see that as a major shift, and whether it's because of lean in or whether it's because we just... Um, a part of it could be, you know, what we're finding with crowdfunding or just the fact that so many of us of, you know, that, are, you know, my age have been professional women for many years and we understand the business markets very, very well. But to see an almost double number, I think, is a, is a huge movement forward, uh, you know, in the whole equity space. Now, uh, you know, I, I actually believe, as you, you ask on whether or not... Uh, you know, we're going to see a change in equity or whether this is going to help women. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, staking, you know, portfolio and, and my work on that very piece. And um, 
You know, I believe that we are going through a major shift right now where women are ready to stand up. But if we look at this historically, you know, before Title II, this was a private club. And we weren't really, as women, invited into that private club. You know, you had, someone had to call you. You know, your buddy at Wilson Sonsini, you know, come on in, we've got a cool deal here to see. And uh, it's really not been that long. I mean, 25 years ago, we could not get business loans with our own name. Right. You know, that legislation's 25 years old. So if you think about it from this bigger perspective, we've not, not only did we not knock on the door, we didn't even know there was a room there. Exactly. <laughs> you know? so, so that's really why I think we're in this major place now where we're going to see a shift. Um, and up until now, the platforms have been basically created for men. I mean, Angel List, the badass platform by the dudes that brought you Angel Hack. If you want to go on on Twitter, that's still you know how they describe themselves. That's there's, I can't count the ways that that doesn't really feel inviting to women. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you for the update, Trisha. And I think um, Candice, from the beginning, I mean you've been a pioneer in this business from the very beginning, and the, your point on debt is so accurate because. Everyone can understand debt. Like you said, we, since we've been in college, we've been paying debt on credit cards and, and mortgages. And not that women can't understand equity. Obviously, that's not true. But I do think it is more inviting overall. It, well, it also answers our, 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 um, um, our feeling towards risk. So yes. uh, debt, by its nature, is liquid. Um, you know that when you put money out, you're going to get it back over a certain period of time with interest. And equity is simply not. Um, and so I think that, you know, we always talk about, I've been to hundreds of these conferences where we talk about equity crowdfunding, how exciting it's going to be and it's going to change the world. And yes, that's all very exciting. But the debt space is so much larger than the equity space, yet so few people are talking about it. And I think that, you know, that's a, that's a real um, opportunity mm -hmm. for those who, uh, who are still looking at how to get involved in the space. Um, because I think that you're going to see a huge sea change in crowdfunding on the debt side. We had a session specifically on debt side on for crowdfunding, specifically that DJ Paul uh, led in January. And if you realize, like you said, how extensive the debt world is, yeah, there's there's a lot of opportunities, not even outside, you know, not even P2P, but within crowdfunding. For debt. Well, and, and there was a, a report that was done by Mass Solution that came out in, uh, at the beginning of this year. And one of the things that they noted was the growth of equity, rewards, and debt-based crowdfunding across the globe over time over the past three years. And the fastest growth year over year is always in debt. I was going to say it's um, really interesting you say that because, like, our platform is strictly debt, like real estate debt. We're not doing the equity, and that well, was Well, good, and we're not doing debt, so we should work together. <laughs> <laughs> no, so we're, like, we're not doing real estate. Yeah. I'm sorry. We're not doing real <laughs> so, estate debt. Yeah, it's um, just, like, one of those decisions you make mm -hmm. when you understand um, the, the market, so... Um, so that same article that you just updated me on, Tricia, um, you know, talks about some of the uh, the movement of female crowdfunding funders and, you know, female executives and politicians overall. We have the Hillary Clintons, Ariana Huffingtons, the Randy Zuckerbergs. Um, but in terms of female crowdfunders and women looking to start their businesses, get funded, and invest in companies themselves, you know, not getting turned down by the bank and, and the 2% that Richard was talking about of never going back to the bank. Like, that's what he's referring to, I believe, when he suggests that crowdfunding is such a great opportunity for, for women and minorities in specific. This, when this article came out last week, um, it suggests that for women to get a VC, they need to have a man in front of the company. I, I don't know if you read the same article, but I mean, does anyone want to comment on that? <laughs> it's insulting. Yes. Isn't it? <laughs> yes. Well, I, I do know specific funds that actually prefer to invest in female um, <clears throat> created ventures. So I, I think that there are some out there. Well, they're, they're, they're the outliers, though. <laughs> I can only speak from personal experience. So my first investor, um, which I will go unnamed today, um, but uh, I went to pitch this investor 
couple few years ago, and um, I took an advisor of mine who was a man, but who had almost nothing to do with my business. Um, he, he simply had a, a personal relationship with the investor. And we went into the, to the meeting, and I'm pitching, and I'm, I'm, going, I'm going through the, 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 the entire presentation, and the, the, the uh, investor only spoke to my advisor the entire time. And he'd say, so now, Craig, tell me about this. And Craig would say, Candace, would you like to answer that? And the entire time, and I'm not the type of woman to play the, the girl card. I'm really not. Um, but I, I started taking Craig with me on all of my uh, meetings in the beginning because I knew that, I, that I, it was helpful. So to this have is that familiar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the data is out there. Uh, it's everywhere. You know, if you haven't seen it, you know, it just takes a quick search. You know, whether it's the Heidi Roizen case where you change Heidi to Harold and all of a sudden her deal is 50% better than when it was run, you know, when it was founded by Heidi. Uh, there's a, the latest one was uh, pitch deck sent out to dozens, hundreds of people and it was um, voiced over by a male or voiced over by a female. The ones voiced over by mail, where I think 30%, you know, judge 30% better. So those, that's, that is what we, we need to just understand and live with as women. But what I would say to you is that the, most of the bias in the venture world is, is unconscious bias. Um, VCs want to make money. That is their world. And they are caught up in a very unfortunate pattern bias. You know, these are the people that have made money for me in the past. It's it, many times, you know, you do so much research, you do so much, you know, data gathering, due diligence, and then it's a gut decision. And way too often the gut decision turns out to be, you know, do they look like other people that have made money for me? And so we need to understand that when we go in. We need to understand that when we present. And then that's why we also need to look at places um, like Portfolio, Mula Hoop, uh, Women's Angel Groups, Plum Alley, and others. Because once you get traction, once you have customers, and once you look like, like a success story, VCs don't care what you look like. They're going to beat the door down to get to you. So it's mm -hmm. really at that beginning where you're, where you're really proving yourself early. And that's why I think uh, crowdfunding can make such a difference. Right. Well, and, and that's a, a lot of times it's that first step that will get you to the next step. Adapia, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I was just in, in thinking about all of this too. I'm, uh, I'm involved with a, a group in Los Angeles called Women in Tech Network, and the point of the group is to bring together women influencers and key contributors and advisors, basically matching women-led or co-led companies to investors, whether that's male or female investors, it doesn't really matter. Um, and the first event was held in November, and I always remember this this girl, she stood up and was asking this panelist of uh, venture capital women and entrepreneurs and angels, and she says, I just think that no one's going to talk to me. What happens if I'm pregnant? What if I get pregnant? And I just thought, that's such the wrong question to be asking right now, and uh. I wonder how many women that aren't successful already just don't have an understanding psychologically of their power and they fall into these patterns. And if she had walked into my office asking that, I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. That, it, regardless of whether you're exactly. a man or a woman. And so mm -hmm. I just wonder, I've, I've mentored a lot of women and worked with so many of them and it just comes down to a psychological, I think, um, just some, some kind of a problem that's societal, um, mm -hmm. I find. A question. Uh, did you deal with big venture capital people? And I was pregnant as I sat there with them. And I watched them change the deal because they heard I was pregnant. Wow. And I was talking really. I, I, don't, I delivered court documents in my hospital room. I was in court three days after delivering my baby. I was a badass. <laughs> it didn't matter. You're a bad girl. <laughs> we got bad girls and uh, bad asses. <laughs> um, uh, one thing I would encourage every, all of us um, on the panel and in the audience to be thinking about is I, I always get a little bit, I, get a, I cringe a little bit on the women, on women in entrepreneurship panel. It kind of makes me cringe. It's like affirmative action. It just kind of makes me cringe. I, I wish we could just get to the point of talking about the deal. Um, talking about the return, talking about the financials, the customer traction, um, and I think that's that's. 
That should be the whole point. Okay, so, so in, the, in the traditional VC, traditional finance space, yes, there has been discrimination, absolutely. But we now are the crowd, and crowdfunding is now legal. And I'd like to change the, the, the dialogue to um, dialogue of the deal rather than dialogue of, 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 the, uh, of the sex or gender. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, one is that we have few entrepreneur ladies in the panel and in the audience that I know and they're very successful. I yeah. Watch them. One of them is a young lady sitting over there with a nice platform and Trish just got good news recently and published it and we're happy with your platform. And that was my comment, but my question is that from audiences there, one is that do you think crowdfunding will be game changer for women entrepreneurs? <coughs> Absolutely. I think it is the game changer for women entrepreneurs. And, you know, we own the majority of private wealth, but there are many, many men that want to back women. And I think this will make a difference. I'm, I'm actually more excited about what crowdfunding can do to democratize access to capital markets. So, uh, yes, I think female entrepreneurs have a huge opportunity to get funded through crowdfunding, but I'm really, really excited about the opportunity to allow the female investor to actually start generating return on her investment by, by looking at deal flow and doing due diligence. I'm really excited about that. I, I agree with that. As an investor, too, I got really excited when I could actually look and, and, and do that, right. do that as well. It's both. It's everything. I think crowdfunding is for everyone. The opportunity is just across the board. Yes, agreed. And my my following question, uh -huh. question is, do you think Hillary Clinton is going to be our next president? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, no, I'm not going to go there. Anyways, um, <laughs> I don't know if any of you want to, but I'm not going to go there personally. But uh, for me, for me, in my business, it w it was never really a liability uh, for me to be a woman. I guess because a lot of times women in media and men in media are are there's a little more evenness. I guess a lot of it depends on what industry type. But what we're hearing from the Richard Swartz of the world and from you know what we're reading in and this panel of experts is that there there are the great opportunities for women entrepreneurs now with crowdfunding that wasn't there before. Let's talk a little bit, you brought it up, Candace, a little bit about the women investors because I know with women investing in women, what we're seeing is some of these women this is this is one of their first opportunities to really invest in in businesses that they're not getting otherwise, and these are are some of the most affluent and most uh, successful women in the world who are looking for these opportunities through crowdfunding in some cases. Um, let's talk a little bit about the woman investor and that model instead of the woman entrepreneur. Okay, so uh, I guess I'll first bring it back to Women Investing in Women, the NGO that I'm general counsel for. And so in, in that organization, the founder, Anu Bardwaj, was a Fulbright scholar and did her Fulbright uh, study on um, women with capital and how much capital is actually controlled in the venture capital and private equity space by women in the GCC. So, so just in, in the Middle East, um, in, in the GCC sector of the Middle East. Um, women control more money, more private equity and venture capital dollars just in the GCC than all of venture capital combined worldwide. Um, so, 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 and, and so um, just in the GCC, there's so much money that's controlled, they're all LPs. They're all quiet. They're all silent. There isn't a single active investor controlling any of that money. And so what, what Women Investing in Women said is, there are so many nonprofit organizations that are training women on how to run their businesses and get trained on how to get a bank loan or how to get investors. That's great. That's really wonderful and it's needed. But who's training all of this capital? Um, who's training the women who have access to the capital in GCC and elsewhere to deploy it? Um, and and mm -hmm. to start having like-minded people on both sides of the equation is, is the best way to, to increase equity over time. 
Yeah, that, there, there is a, a huge opportunity with that. And while we're talking about women investing in women, and Anu will have to watch this, and I'm sure her ears are ringing, um, I'm chairing the Women Investing in Women um, Summit that we're doing here in San Francisco and Silicon Valley uh, this summer. So anybody that wants to be on that list or wants to know more or wants to be involved, you know, please uh, see me after this. You know, there's what Candace is talking about with the limited partner world is huge. And so many family offices that access so much money are now starting to be run. Their investment committees are being run by women of the family, which is really starting to shift a lot of things, uh, a lot of the, the focus of these organizations. Um, the other part of this from the investing side and looking at uh, institutional investors is 20 years ago, uh, women uh, GPs were about 3%. Uh, they went up to about 12 to 13% about 10 years ago when they peaked, and they're now, um, for those firms over $200 million, about 4.2%. But that's not the whole story. There's actually a really exciting story underneath that. And that's that those women with 15 and 20 years that have been on the Midas list are leaving those billion-dollar firms there's 60 that I know of that actually have started their own firms now. Uh, the one that's been getting all the press lately is Aspect Ventures, Jennifer Fonstad, and uh, Teresa Gao. Um, there, are, there are dozens of them. And this is really a whole new wave of women venture capitalists that are raising those $100 million funds, but they're completely in charge of their priority, their investment thesis. And, and they're building completely new and exciting uh, models. Um, I think some of the first innovation I've seen in the last 20 years in the venture capital world are coming from these VCs, from Adele Oliva, that's just founded 1315 Partners in the life sciences space, a whole new model. Tracy Warren just founded Astarte Ventures, a brand new model, not the 22 you know, kinds of things that we've seen in the past. So I think we're, we're entering potentially the golden age for women investors, both VCs, and angels and crowdfunding women that are um, that are really going to be significant, not just in women's business, but in men's run business or or truly blended businesses are the best because we get right. uh, we get a right. mix of those kind of skill sets. But um, I, I think we're really seeing huge change. Yeah, and I was going to ask um, Autopia when it comes to real estate that you know that that tends to be I think for women in general. Um, something, I mean, for people in general, very palatable, very tangible to be able to invest in. And I'm wondering if you're seeing an increase in women on your investor side at Patch of Land. Um, I mean, there's a good mix, actually. Yeah. Like, I'm, I hadn't really thought of that as a question before, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to think. Like, there's a, there's a good mix. I mean, women tend to be, I mean, this might seem very, you know, sexist even just saying it, but, like, we're more focused on our home anyway, and real estate makes, you know, it makes a lot of sense. That's what drew me to real estate crowdfunding in the first place. Right. Coming off of my previous experiences, is this is easy to understand. Anybody can understand it. Um, but uh, it, you know, it's definitely exciting for anyone to uh, to get into. But yeah, if if I'm thinking about the number of investors that we have on there, there's a good chunk that are that are women. Absolutely. Well, and, and it's the same thing with debt, Candace, and real estate. Um, in our, in our view, and a lot of the summits that we're having this year are focused on these because we feel that real estate, debt, the things that everyone, the crowd can identify with, just, you know, woman or man, whoever, that is easy for them to identify with is what is going to really push crowdfunding alternative finance forward. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting because that... Um, so we're host I, I'm co-chairing a Women Investing in Women event in San Diego um, in <laughs> July, um, and one of the things that we're focusing on is um, emerging sectors. So, so you know, China versus Brazil, um, minorities and and female entrepreneurs, um, where there are opportunities that have not necessarily been tapped by the larger VCs, and where um, the mid-range, uh, you know, to to you know the, the the smaller accredited investor can more actively engage and have more opportunity for a high return. And we're focused on China, Brazil, women and minorities. Interesting, yeah. interesting. And I, I would have to add that I think uh, among the venture capital funds um, in emerging markets such as China and India, there's there are more female general partners than here mm -hmm. in the US. So we all have more in common than I thought because we have the women in investing in Austin <laughs> at the end of May. 
Um, as we all know, this is the second anniversary of the Jobs Act coming up, and uh, uh, more entrepreneurs will be turning to crowdfunding and turning their dreams into reality. Obviously, that's true for women and men. Um, would you guys all like to focus just a little bit on how your companies bring that to reality? Sure. So um, the Jobs Act actually isn't all that helpful <laughs> um, to, to my industry um, because uh, the Jobs Act was not set up to facilitate debt transactions for a number of reasons. There's a 21-day cool-off period. Um, there's the inability for the platform to co-invest with the investors on the platform. And as you've learned from Prosper and Lending Club and others, that, that's not a model that actually works for the debt-based peer-to-peer uh, -peer or peer-to-business space. So while the Jobs Act is great, um, it's, not, it's not a silver bullet. There's a lot of changes. There are a lot of changes that are still needed. There's a Jobs Act 2.0 in my mind that has to be written in order for it to ever affect the debt space. Um, and in the meantime, by the way, all of these other platforms are finding ways around the Jobs Act to facilitate debt-based Good point. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the part of the Jobs Act that's been uh, most valuable for us really is Title II. Um, because it shuts down the private club and opens things up and lets people publicly talk about, you know, raising money. So we are using uh, Title II. A lot of our companies are publicly disclosing their uh, investing, and um, it, it enables us to get out a lot to a lot more. And these are all accredited investors, of course, but to a lot more accredited investors. And it's the concept, really, w that we've learned from crowdfunding from other non-equity spaces. You know. Uh, uh, affluent women, because they're not that experienced in investing, you know, they may write out a hundred thousand dollar check to a philanthropy uh, and not think that that much about it. But because they've not done equity investing, you know, you're not going to write out for your first investment that hundred thousand dollar check. You know, so the ability to be able to go in with a lot of other people and and dip your toe in, you know, five thousand, twenty five hundred you know, and start to learn it. Because we like to learn, we like to know how to do things. We like to read the instructions. So this enables you know, even affluent women to learn what they're doing and to feel like they can start without having to write out that, you know, 50 or $100,000 check. Right. Uh, we're in the we're in the same situation. We're um, Title II and looking forward to what happens when uh, Title IV most likely uh, is going to be the thing to change things for us. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty. That's it. That'll be exciting. Yeah. Rebecca, uh, as a content person, it gives me more to write about. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any questions? I have, I have two questions. Okay. Question number one. Congratulations. Woo. Oh, oh. I one as a token. So <laughs> Hello, Let's daughter number what, what, what number two. Daughter number two. Uh, my question is that what can, I have two questions. The first one is, these young women that are coming up, is there something to tell them to say, look, this is some things that you can, steps you can take, things you can learn right now to help so that when the time comes, you're poised to take advantage of it. And question number two is, are women... Is it possible to view women as a community and a category? And if they're, they have all this money, if I'm looking for investment from a crowdfunding st standpoint, is there something how I can craft my campaign to attract the things that women as a group would be interested in investing in? So two questions. One is, what do I tell my young daughters coming forward that they can take advantage of this? And number two, what can I do to uh, be more attractive to, well, that didn't come out right. <laughs> yes, we got. I I got it. You guys got it. Got it. So so I have uh, I have twenty three year old twin daughters. So you know I know what I'm telling them. And and the first thing is is that start right now. Start right now mm -hmm. investing. You know you can invest in comp in companies that you know and that you love because you're seeing things that your dad doesn't know about. You're in the middle of new technologies that are taking off and growing that a lot of us with money don't even see yet. Um, my daughters are each putting $100 aside a month. They're just you know, a couple years out of college. And then they're taking that collective $2,400 a year, and they're investing in one or two companies. You know, and, and on Portfolio.com, we have companies with a minimum of $1,000 that you can go into that are aggregated into an LLC. So it's investing in what you know. It's stepping up and learning it. 
And you know, if you only invest even you know a small amount like that, in five years, you can have 10 companies in your portfolio. And you're going to know things at 25 or 28 years old that we just learned in our 50s. You know, so it's that kind of thing. Jump in, invest with friends. It's a lot more fun that way. And, and use small stakes and, you know, just start to jump in and learn it because that's how you're successful with it. So, so, so my, my answer is going down even a little bit. You look still like you're, you know, a mature young woman. Um, and, and I will say that the, the, the first, um, uh, the second bad girl that I ever invested in through Bad Girl Ventures um, was a nine-year-old. Uh, her name was Rosie Dean. She was a turkey farmer, and uh, and I invested. Uh, my, my nonprofit invested about twenty five thousand dollars in her turkey farm, and she's more profitable than most of my other bad girls combined at this point. And she's in the sixth grade. And um, what I can tell you, she did. Um, first of all, she started a business young. And, you know, we, we make fun of lemonade stands and all those things, but if you have young children, encourage them to start businesses young at a small scale um, because they learn a lot about economics by running a small business. Um, and so that's how Rosie started with her turkey farm. She started with one turkey, uh, a midget white, which is, by the way, very competitive with chicken wow. on menus and is great <laughs> at four-star restaurants. Um, but what, the second thing I will say what is... What is she doing now? Um, she, she's, she's got a full enterprise going right now, but what I'll also say is she actually had an entrepreneurship and an investing class in the fifth grade in her elementary school. And so one of the things that you can be encouraging your schools, um, your educational institutions to start doing is to start encouraging um, economics education and entrepreneurship education at the elementary level. And then on making uh, companies attractive to women, you know, I think it's, it's, it's often the same as making companies attractive to men. But, um, you know, whether it's VCs or it's women on our crowdfunding platform, they are looking for teams they believe in. Um, that's what we're all looking for, teams that we think can make it work, and they want to be brought into a part of the story. I think one area where we've seen, and I think, uh, you know, our earlier speaker talked about it, is that you want to have impact you know, that it, that, uh, that it has, has something similar to impact and that you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself. Uh, and I think those are all very important pieces. But honestly, most VCs I know want the same thing. They're wanting to be a part of something that they think has the capacity to, to change or shift the world. But back to Devin and the very beginning of the <laughs> panel discussions today, I will say that of the, the platforms I've run and the women I've talked to who are investors on those platforms, they have said they prefer to invest where they can do well by doing good. Um, there is something to be said for social enterprise, and I'm not saying that they're not looking for a return, but the, the message is much stronger for the female investors I've worked with if you can show that you're doing well by doing good. And there was another question I thought. Intrastate mm -hmm. crowdfunding? Yeah, mm -hmm. intrastate crowdfunding exemption. So that means there's, say, 35 or 30 something that aren't, right? So to me, it seems like a big impact that something could do as you see is getting those states to do their own state level. Even if you don't believe in the you know, constraints of the state, it still creates that kind of proof by existence that they enable something and that shows something outside the heavy regulation, <laughs> then that becomes the de facto, like, that's doable. So other states can adopt it, and then the feds will have to be forced into You want to take that one, Candace? <laughs> well, I, I'd say stay tuned for tomorrow morning's panel discussions. I know that um, that we've got the experts from uh, from the regulatory groups that have been working with the SEC and with the state regulators and with NASA. Um, I'm looking at one of the people who will be speaking tomorrow morning, Chris Tyrrell, who you heard him speak earlier. Um, and that's a great question to ask of them. Um, I'll, I'll caveat uh, the, the, <laughs> the state, intrastate um, crowdfunding with this. We haven't seen a ton of successes yet, uh, and now it's early. Um, but you know, I think that what you're finding is with the Kickstarters and Indiegogos of the world, um, it's not location-centric. I originally thought it was, by the way. My, com my old company was based on local lending. I don't know that that's actually what's happening. Uh, people are being drawn to industries and stories and management teams that they, can, uh, that they can associate with, even if they're not in their own home state. So I would agree with you, the more interstate we can do, the better. Um, I just, I, we, haven't seen, we haven't seen a ton of early success yet with them. And, 
and, and it's, you know, for their economic and tax basis and everything that makes the state want to do it for the reason why the state wants to do it. And I get your point. It's, it's true. It should come from the state that would then drive the federal, push it that much further. But I think what Candace is saying and what we're seeing is that the states are a little bit behind what the federal government had initially had planned. Was there, I thought I saw another hand. Oh, okay, go ahead. So I'm curious what you think. What will be, will there be a, a vehicle that's more dynamic than the venture capital in terms of pitching crowd inputs that will displace or disintermediate today's dodgy venture capital? Trish? Uh, so parts of craft, I think there are many pe parts of crowdfunding that are, that are in the process of disintermediating disintermediating venture capital right now. I think AngelList is, uh, there are a number of things, that the syndicates on AngelList are, uh, could potentially be very difficult for venture capital because you know when limited partners go in, they pay 2% annual fee and 20% of their carry. If they can get into the same deals, uh, you know, without it, with what, 5% carry maybe and new, no management fee. Uh, I think especially family offices are going to be taking a look at that. Um, you know, there are a number of different models, even, you know, uh, the uh, Funders Club and others that are putting together uh, aggressive syndicates. We're going to be doing the same. And I would say in five years, uh, that the venture world is going to be changing dramatically. They're going to be moving up. Uh, you know, uh, uh, upstream, uh, and already, I mean, angels, yes. when angels came in 15 years ago, it substantially changed the venture capital world. I think uh, what we're going to see with crowdfunding is going to be five times the magnitude of, of what angels did. And I'll also say, stay tuned with that question, too. I believe Charlie Sidman might be speaking tomorrow, and I know that he's got some thoughts on that as well, so. I think what, one question to ask, though, is, is whether the venture capitalist, uh, with the years of experience and, and the industry experience, add value to the deals and actually may produce better returns? <clears throat> well, I think that, you know, I think we always are going to need VCs for major scalable later stage investing. You know, I mean, they bring, bring great value. Uh, but one thing that's happened in the world over the last 10 years that happens almost so slowly that it's hard to remember, 10 years ago, only one out of 10 deals were consumer-facing companies. Today, it's about one out of three and trending upwards. And if you've looked at the unicorn studies, 48% of the unicorns are consumer-facing, straight to the consumer. So. You know, it was different 10 years ago. The reason VCs were so great is that they could call up the CTO of the big company, you know, and get in and bring them customers. With a consumer market, your ability to call up the CTO is not, is not the real value add. So, so it's whether it is uh, Steve Blank's Lean Startup that's shifting it, or it's different kind of industries today and different kind of consumers, um, you know, all of these things are working together to shift the venture capital world. We are going to have to wrap it up, but I really uh, want to thank you all for your questions and for uh, sticking around for our panel. And thank you to these awesome ladies for joining me on this session. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you.